Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful to be back with my brothers and sisters in Christ um, who just desire to know you more, to taste and see that you're good, to know your word on, on an in-depth level, not for the sake of knowledge, but for the sake of knowing you intimately, uh, knowing you fully, that we may walk rightly in a manner that is worthy of Christ, that in all things that we do, that we are able uh, to trust in you, to lean on you, to depend on you through all things, and that in all things that we are able to have joy. That's been the theme of our time through the book of Philippians is joy, that when, the, when life gets the best of us, Father, that we know that because we are in you and that we have you, that we can make it through because of you. And so we thank you for that. Now, Lord, I ask that what we know not will you teach us, what we have not will you give us, and who we are not will you make us. I ask that you open up our eyes, that we will behold wondrous things in your law, and that you'll open up our minds, that we'll understand the scriptures. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen and amen. So tonight, again, we're coming up to our tail end of chapter 3 of the book of Philippians. And what we've been doing is we've discovered over time... Uh, the richness of Christ, the grandeur of Christ, the glory of Christ. And if we were to break down our chapter three, what we're seeing is that our reward comes from Christ. Our reward comes from Christ. And last week we discussed that how joy in this walk of life, it can really be snuffed out if we're constantly looking back to the past. We talked about that last week, that when we look back on things and maybe our failures and our shortcomings and we begin to harp and depend and look to those things, that if we don't see and recognize the positional reality that we have in Christ, that we can have joy in a sense sucked out and we can miss the true joy that we possess in Christ Jesus. The reality is the enemy tends to utilize our past failures and our obstacles as hindrances with our walk in the Lord. Again, Paul's primary focus was for the believer in Philippi to understand that our measly works, our, our accolades, our abilities pale in comparison to the glory and the grandeur of Christ in his work. As a matter of fact, Paul stated that his works and our works as well are at best lacking in all things, but when we think about Christ, Christ has fulfilled all things. Therefore, when we realize who we are in him, that our ability to be able to strive for his name and to do the work that he's called us to do, that we can do it not in our own strength, not in our own striving, but through and by his strength. Therefore, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, our primary aim is that we may know him. Remember uh, Philippians 3, that we may know him. And as we grow in knowing Jesus, we're able to behold the true prize. The true prize, and that is being with Christ. Being with Christ. So our joy in Christ, again, is experiential and is fully realized when we learn to grow in him beyond just knowing about him. Right. Just knowledge for knowledge's sake. And this reality helps believers in Christ walk through this life with a light grip on the things that we hold and possess in this life. And it actually allows us to walk freely, freely in the sense that we know where our treasure truly lies. It lies in heaven. That's where we're going to be. Therefore, our rewards are not corruptible rewards. Our rewards that we'll attain in the future will be incorruptible. So tonight, Paul, friends, is going to further expound. He's going to further expound on this premise of growing in the second tense of our salvation. Growing in the second tense of our salvation. That as we mature in Christ, our aims, our priorities begin to shift from the world and temporal things to that of heavenly and eternal things. If I were to kind of put an outline of our time through the text tonight, we're going to see the following things. We're going to see three things. The first thing is going to be an attitude of maturity, an attitude of maturity. That's going to be verses 15 through 16. Secondly, we're going to see that we must set our minds on things eternal, setting our minds on things eternal. That's going to be verses 17 through 19. And thirdly, having an eternal perspective, 
having an eternal perspective. And that's found in verses 20 through 21. And if I were to put a tag on our time tonight, it would simply be this. The hope of things to come. The hope of things to come. So with that being said, I invite you to go ahead and meet me in Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 through 16 for the reading of the word of the Lord. And this is what Paul, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, writes. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So Paul, friends, he's starting to wrap up his point in these latter verses to emphasize emphasizing the need to continue striving for a level of maturity in Christ towards completion. And in his encouragement to pursue this walk and lifestyle of maturity, he mentions that this way of life requires having a certain attitude in mind, having a certain attitude in mind. And this attitude in which Paul is speaking about is an attitude of daily striving, daily striving to look more like Christ in every area of your and my life. In other words, our positional reality in Christ should produce in our hearts an appetite for knowing all that we can experientially in Christ. I want us to remember something, that joy is not circumstantial. Joy is not circumstantial, but rather it's experiential. And the more that we experience Christ in our walk with him, the more we become like him the more we become like him. And the reality is for some, this can become quite difficult because as I mentioned before, everyone is on a different level of spiritual maturity in their walk with Christ. This means that there are gonna be some who will have greater difficulty in their walks than others. However, what remains the same in it all? What remains the same is that God's grace for us is provided in all shapes and sizes. So whether you're the most mature and you fall short, his grace is sufficient. Whether you're a new baby in Christ, his grace is most assuredly sufficient because he knows that we are prone to wonder, we're prone to fail. So again, this becomes the reason why Paul began these concluding remarks in chapter 3, verse 15, with the phrase, let us therefore. You see that in your text? Let us therefore. And Paul wants the main thing to be the main thing. Because as we saw Paul mention last week, we all should be pressing towards the prize, right? Verse 14, we saw we are pressing toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this idea of pressing toward the goal was that of an Olympic race that was in mind, an Olympic race. And with anyone who, who runs in a tournament or a competition, the only point of focus is not the person to your left, not the person to your right, but it's the prize at hand, the prize up ahead. And in this case, again, as we mentioned last week, Paul's ultimate point is that it is Jesus Christ who is our goal. Nothing more, nothing less. Christ is the one in whom we run for, we strive for, we live for. Why? Because we are found richly in him. We also discussed last week that God in Christ, he began this work in us through justification. He's sustaining this work in us. That's sanctification through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. And we know that we're going to be glorified in Christ in that glorification process. And all of this is being accomplished in Christ, not ourselves, not our works, but by the work of Christ. Therefore, even with the spiritual rewards that we are able to attain because of our losses in this life, the true prize is to behold Christ alone. As, as one theologian had noted, he said this, and I quote, Christ is the goal of our faith for a heavenly righteousness the goal of our love for heavenly fellowship, and the goal of our hope for heavenly blessedness. So although in this life, 
as we serve Christ, there are rewards to be attained, and we thank God for that. Understand and know that the ultimate reward is being with Christ and knowing him. Therefore, our striving for maturity is not for the sake of rewards, just for rewards' sake, but to fully know Christ and to be known by him. Remember, I, I emphasize that all the time. You can literally meditate on Philippians 3 in and around 12 through 15, that Paul gets into this discourse of saying, I just want to know him. All of my accolades, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, all of these things pale in comparison to just knowing Jesus, just knowing him. So again, Paul's continuing on by mentioning that if there is one who has a different mindset, if there's one who has a different mindset of trusting in Christ, leaning upon Christ, he mentions that God would make known that to them. If there's something different, if your mind is set on something else, God is going to make that known to you to make a pivot. He's going to make it known to you to make a pivot. A few lessons ago, we came to understand, really in a general sense, the roles of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I had this whole list of probably like seven or eight things. And some of the roles of the Holy Spirit takes on is that of teaching, that of convicting, and that of revealing. Teaching, convicting, and revealing. And that's because the Holy Spirit, again, being that he's our teacher, that as we submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit in obedience to the Lord's leading, our mindsets begin to be reframed. It's like something changes, like our disposition on what we see, how we think, as we submit to the Holy Spirit, those things begin to fade off as everything else in Christ begins to be illuminated and lifted up. As a matter of fact, this is in direct connection with what Paul mentioned earlier about having an appetite for Christ. And I love that term that he used, having an appetite for Christ. Because this means that as you condition your heart, as you condition your mind to respond positively to the enablement of the Holy Spirit, so will your life follow suit. What do I mean by that? How can I break that down plainly? When you obey, you'll see blessings. We see that in Deuteronomy when Moses gives the second giving of the law. When you obey, you will see this. You will reap this. When you don't obey, you will have curses. You will see this. You will experience this. So you can't expect to understand God's will for your life on a day-by-day -day basis if you fail to make the time to know what his word says. The two work hand in hand. Because it's in God's word that you're actually going to understand what his will is. And in understanding his will, you'll know how to seek him all the more. So Paul, in verse 16, he, he makes a simple point, which is this. Keep living. He, he uses the term. Keep living in a way that reflects positionally who you are in Christ. That's our focus in this life. And I love it because the term keep living is so important especially outside of the context of the New Testament. Because keep living, that, that phrase, that word in the Greek is actually a military term. It's a military term. It means to be in a row or in a rank of position, to fall into alignment. And the idea of the use of this word connotes obedience and submission. Therefore, the only way by which one can continue in a manner of growth and maturity in Christ is through submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit and the entrusting ourselves into the word of God. So Paul encourages these already mature believers in Christ, right? Paul's made this known already, to keep on putting on the mind of Christ and to live in a way that reflects who they are in Christ positionally. Friends, the reality is we are to put on the mind of Christ and to adopt his attitude in all things and to continue striving to know him, not for knowledge's sake, but to know him intimately. When you know him intimately, you start seeing your life beginning to shift and move in completely new directions than what you have before, because knowledge has now become applied.
And again, as a reminder, this striving that Paul was talking about was not in the sense of striving for what we've already attained by grace. He's not talking about straining and striving to be justified. He said, you're already justified. You're not striving for that. What you are striving for is to look more, be more, to be conformed into the image of Christ. And as we discovered in previous lessons in Philippians, the journey of spiritual maturity is not one that happens overnight. This is where many Christians, many believers get frustrated because we think, man, once I got saved, everything changed from that moment. And in fact, it has. But what has not changed is how you perceive and look at the world. Your worldview has to change. The way that your worldview begins to change is as you entrust your understanding of how the world looks, not through your lens, not through your eyes, but through the lens of the scriptures. That's how you begin to pivot, right? I used that word earlier. You are able to pivot because you're now enabled and empowered to live in a way that glorifies God. So the process of sanctification is a constantly ongoing journey that requires one to be patient with themselves and with others, humble and reliant upon the Lord every day. Every day. Think about it in the present world that we live in. Everyone wants the quick path to success or instant pathway to health, wealth, and prosperity. Yet no one wants to actually put in the work to be great or to do great things. We just expect it. I, I call it the microwave solution instead of the crock pot solution. The crock pot takes some time. When my wife makes a nice roast beef, it takes eight good hours. But when I get home from church or get home from work, that thing is filling up. The room is filling up the home versus putting uh, here we go a uh, roast beef meal in the microwave for three minutes. You're going to taste the difference. You can smell the difference. Friends, I like to think about it this way. The only way that a bodybuilder can get to the level of intense weightlifting that they're able to do is if they first start off by actually going to the gym, right? And from there, they start making up their minds that they want to put themselves now under the weight and the pressure of the weights within that gym, and they're going to apply the pressure in their life day by day by day. I'm not going to be the huge muscular pectoral guy in two days if I go to the gym only lifting 25-pound dumbbells. I can't expect that result. But if I continue to grow in a way that I'm applying that pressure day by day, month by month, year by year, I can ultimately get to the goal in which I want to see. And in the same way, if your desire to see your growth in the Lord is desiring to grow to know him, you must get in the game. You got to get in the game and at the same time be patient with yourself because you can get to a point where folks are trying to do, 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 and work, 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 and grow, 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 that you actually can experience burnout, even in your walk with Christ. So we have to learn how to understand that we walk this walk of sanctification with grace lenses in mind. This is why, friends, having a healthy discipleship relationship is important. Going to the gym to exercise is much more encouraging it's much easier, I feel, in my own estimation, when you're going and working out with somebody else. You got a workout partner. You can't expect in the same way to do this life of Christianity, walking in isolation by yourself, trying to work through progressive sanctification, even more so with the mindset of independence rather than dependence. When I have a workout partner I, and somebody's spotting me, they're spotting me because I'm about to take a load that I can't bear by myself. Therefore, they're there to carry that weight. But just imagine if you have 200 pounds that you're trying to bench press by yourself and you don't have a spotter. That thing's going to come caving down on your chest if you haven't built yourself up in that way. So I'll, I'll put it this way plainly. A grace-oriented sanctification is one in which is ever reliant and dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Whereas a legalistic approach to growth 
is rules on top of rules on top of self-appointed righteousness, therefore producing a byproduct of independence from God. You want to see what legalism looks like? Doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and putting rules as to how I do it, how I see it. Versus what does God say? What does his word say? That's what the Judaizers were doing. You have to conform to the law to be sanctified. You have to conform to the law and be circumcised in order to be justified. That's what the Judaizers were saying. Paul said, no, you're justified by Christ alone through faith alone. Nothing more, nothing less. So we we're now coming up to see, and we're going to see a little bit later in verses 17 through 19, why Paul is going to use this military term, this phrase, keep living, worked out. And again, they're going to see that in verses 17 through 19. This is what the text says. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that there are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So Paul's, he's getting into some deep stuff here. He, he's continuing on in his thought as he's transitioning now to a practical example of maintaining this way of living and having this appetite for Christ. Now, on the onset, when you read through this, you may come across this and you may say, well, man, Paul seems to be boasting a bit in his leadership as somehow being more mature than others. That's how some people can come across it and read. But that's not the case. That's not what Paul's doing here. In fact, you may recall Paul in Philippians chapter 2, he provided again that list of of, of accolades in which he has um, acclaimed to or has worked for. Again, circumcised on the eighth day, Hebrew of Hebrews, I've done all of these things, persecuted the church, zealous for the law, all of those things. But yet what we find here when Paul began to move towards the example section of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, who was the first person or the first example that Paul uses? Not himself. Christ. He uses Christ as the ultimate example as to who we are to pattern our lives after. Furthermore, it was in verse 16 that Paul used the military term for keep living, keep living. And, and that Greek word stokeo, which means to fall in line, that you spell that S-T-O-I-C-H-E-O. -E and that, again, that word means to fall in line. So when you put together what Paul is saying in those verses, his MO, his motivation is not to follow him because he thinks he's reached perfect maturity. Rather, Paul is encouraging the Philippians and even you and I today to fall in line, to get into the ranks as we together follow Christ. As a matter of fact, the phrase join in following my example is actually one word in the Greek. I want you to see the English word is one, two, three, four, five English words. Join in my join in following my example. It's one word in the Greek, and that word in the Greek is simietes. Simietes. S Y M M I M E T E S. And that means fellow imitator or joint imitator. And the idea here is, as I walk, you walk. As I obey, you obey. As I do, you do. If, if, you're, if you're like me, I like watching military movies, um, movies with special ops and, and, you know, black ops and all of that stuff. And one of the interesting things to watch is when you see individuals in basic training, right, when they're preparing. And their daily routine will oftentimes consist of them falling and getting into alignment in rank and file. And in those, those famous movies, you'll see them kind of jogging. Everywhere we go, everywhere we go, the captain, people want to know, people want to know. And they're doing this all the way through. That's what Paul's getting to here. Paul's saying that Christ is the leader. Christ is the commander. Christ is the captain. 
And we as the bride of Christ, we are to follow in alignment and in the pattern with Christ. And those friends who are composed of the body of Christ are to submit to the commanding instructions and to call on God and to follow suit by the will and the instructions of God himself. Therefore, we conclude what? Paul's not boasting when he says, imitate me. Paul's saying and encouraging these brothers and sisters at Philippi to fall in line with Christ. In other words, don't get out of sync with Christ and his gospel. Stay in alignment. And in this sense, because Christ is not physically present before the Philippians, Christ is at work within them. How is he at work within them? Well, remember earlier in Philippians, there's a fellowship of the spirit. We all have the spirit of Christ in our hearts and in our lives. And being that the apostle Paul has already set himself up as a good example of following Christ to these individuals in Philippi, he is now inviting these Philippian believers to follow him. Follow me. And what does that break down to? That's discipleship. As I do, you do. As I'm growing, you're going to grow. As I put in the pressure, you're going to have the pressure applied. Again, Paul stakes no claim to have reached this sense of perfection in his maturity. He is simply saying, join me in my pursuit of Christ. So Paul is going to continue now by offering not just himself as an example in which the Philippians can observe, but he mentions that there are those in whom the Philippians know as well. He's saying, I'm not just the only guy that you can follow. They got some others that you've been introduced to, right? In fact, it was in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, that Paul mentioned two other men. Who are the two other men that Paul mentioned? Timothy and Epaphroditus, who were worthy men. Epaphroditus, Paul goes on for about several verses, and he lets them know, Epaphroditus almost died for the sake of serving me and serving you to the glory of Christ. He mentioned it three times. There seems to be, and hopefully this is not just in my own understanding, but hopefully you're seeing it as you walk through the text yourself, that there's this sub-theme that's happening in the text. That sub-theme is practical discipleship. Practical discipleship, meaning that discipleship goes beyond just knowing information, right? It requires that one observe the very life of those who live in a way that reflects the mind of Christ in their living. That these individuals exercise wisdom in their lives so that they may further be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, please understand and, and hear me when I say this. <laughs> Listening to the teachings provided on the ministry app is one thing. Right. You have access to solid expository Bible teaching verse by verse. However, it's a whole other thing to put into practice the truths that expository teaching and preaching provide. Gospel transformation does not happen by osmosis. Just because I'm listening to Steve or just because I'm listening to Wesley and I'm walking down and I've listened to one podcast in the morning, one podcast in the afternoon, that somehow all of that information and study that they've done in a 70-hour week has now downloaded it to me and now I'm maturing. No. That's not what's happening. Gospel transformation, again, it happens through putting in the sweat equity through the enabling power of the Spirit of God in you. For there are many people that think simply being under sound expository teaching is enough to help them grow in maturity. Now, don't get me wrong. Sound teaching is a huge component. It's, it's necessary to have that, but it must be accompanied with accountability to apply what you've learned. This is how you have so many well-knowledgeable, well-learned people, yet lacking the ability to walk out their salvation well. If I were to give you a simple definition of what wisdom is, wisdom at its core is applied knowledge applied knowledge. 
Therefore, Paul's encouragement becomes similar to what he shares with the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Go there with me really quickly. I'll read it into your hearing. But again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Here's Paul's words. Be imitators of me just as I also am of who? Christ. So Paul, again, he's not saying, follow me because I'm fully mature and you're not fully mature yet. No, that's not what he's saying. Follow me as I'm seeking to follow Christ. In other words, I'm getting into rank and file. I'm getting into alignment with Christ. And as I'm getting into rank and file, come alongside me and let's walk together. If you've ever seen um, a strategic tactical moves of the military, have you ever noticed that when they're filing suit, they're in sync and step? They're always in file. And Paul is saying, be in line. Be in, don't get out of line. So ultimately, what is, what is Paul saying? Christ is the goal, not me. To look more like Christ in our lives, our actions, our responses, and our love, that's the goal. And that's the goal to do that well in this broken life that we call the world today. And the way in which this has worked out in our lives, along with the fellowship of the spirit that we have, is the discipleship of godly men and women. What comes to mind, one of the first scriptures that comes to mind is Titus 2, 1 through 12. Older men pouring into the younger men, older women pouring into the younger women. Why is that important? Because the younger men need wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? elderly individuals. But hold on, Wes, because I've seen it, maybe you've seen it too, that you can have older people that have lived longer years on this earth, but yet can be absolute fools. So it has to work in tandem with one another. Here's just a food for thought. Who's discipling you? Who do you walk alongside day by day that this person's life, the way that they study the word and the way that they live their lives points you to Christ? Is there somebody in your life like that? If there's not, I encourage you to find somebody. Because again, doing this life in isolation will suck the joy out of your life. Doing it in fellowship and in partnership with others will bring about immense joy in your life. Why? Because as that great, the great theme song, we're all in this together, from Disney Channel, when they didn't lose their minds. <laughs> this is the encouragement, right, that Paul gives. And at the same breath, he's also providing a warning of sorts, right? Because depending on who you lend your ear to gives way to the direction in which your life goes. You're going to see that in 1 Kings. You, you've seen that in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. There's a statement that I, I've used before and I, I've coined it from other theologians and pastors. As goes the king, so goes the people. Who you lend your life to is the direction in which your life is going to go. There will either be a molding in your life that is being shaped in Christ's likeness or looking and sounding more like the world. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. I want you to notice something really quickly. Notice how Paul transitions to verses 18 and 19. Because he moves from the positive modeling now to the negative modeling. Do you see that? And he desires that the believers in Philippi not give in to the way of negative modeling. He, he begins by saying, for many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. It's very clear that Paul's affections and his love for the Philippian church become demonstrated in a very real way to the point that the scriptures show us, to the point that Paul is tearful, he's crying. He's grieving over this church. 
He desire, his desire, Paul's desire, is that the Philippian church not be tricked, not be deceived by false teaching and their lives and the lives of others who claim that they believe or that they know the truth. Folks are getting duped. And it's here that Paul addresses now, he seems to be targeting another group here. Paul seems to be targeting another group of individuals who potentially seem to be outside of the church, yet they're managing to have influence among the church. Among the church. This group that Paul calls the enemies of the cross of Christ were none other than a group called the Gnostics. The Gnostics. Gnostics were of the belief that their group, their, their, their section, their little cult, if you will, possessed additional secret knowledge regarding matters of salvation. Oh, you have information? Well, we have the real deal, right? Therefore, this group's antinomastic disposition led them to do what seemed right in their own eyes. Ultimately, this led to the rejection of truth of Scripture, thereby granting license to sin. And clearly, these individuals that Paul had in mind here were not within the church of Philippi, but were misleading Christians elsewhere. And potentially, Paul is experiencing that this threat of licentiousness is now beginning to move closer to the Philippian church, that somehow there may be some individuals that are possibly adopting some way of life or living as what they see or have heard from these false teachers. In any case, it's certain that Paul has been moved deeply to the point of tears in how believers were being misled by these false teachers. And what this ultimately shows us is that the Philippian church was actually held very close to the heart of Paul. Paul loved this church. Hopefully you've seen how deeply Paul loves this church from the beginning of Philippians 1. That Paul wanted to guard them from this spiritual confusion and chaos that was creeping in and around the church. So like a father to a child, he writes with a heavy heart, conveying the reality that these Gnostics were indeed enemies of the cross of Christ. The phrase enemies of the cross of Christ simply means individuals or groups alienated in the sense of hostility towards the cross. There's this hostility towards what Christ is about. Meaning that where the cross of Christ meant dying to oneself, they saw this as a hindrance and an opportunity to indulge in their own personal delights. That where grace was an opportunity of growth in the power of the Spirit, the Gnostics would see that and abuse the understanding of God's grace as a means and license to sin. Oh, God's grace is sufficient? Oh, well, we can keep doing this. Oh, God's grace is good and His mercy endures forever? I wonder how long forever is. And so there's this constant pushing of the boundary. So what we find in verse 19 is Paul spelling out three characteristics of these particular people. I want you to notice Paul begins by mentioning what the results of these individuals were. He says their end was destruction. Understand the use of this term within the New Testament would suggest that destruction in this particular context is regarding eternal destruction for the unbeliever. Eternal destruction for the unbeliever. And this seems fitting, right? It seems fitting because as Paul mentioned earlier, if this were a believer that is doing these things, falling victim in this way, engaging in abhorrent lifestyles of sin that they would be convicted, that there would be conviction of the Holy Spirit. We saw that at the end of verse 15. And the reason for this is because all believers have what? We all have the Holy Spirit indwelt within us. Therefore, because we belong to God, he will deal accordingly with us. What does that look like in a practical sense? One, conviction. When I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, the Holy Spirit will alert me in my spirit. And if I continue in that, 
the Lord is going to use a means of discipline to redirect me so that I will be able to do what it is that the Lord desires for me to do. However, for a believer, there comes a point in a believer's life that where they, if they have gone so far to the point that there is no return, as you've seen in Jude in around verse 22 and 23, to the point that their garment stains are filthy, there is what is called sin unto death. Sin unto death. This is where the believer's sin has transpired to the point of no return. I mean, that's simply meaning habitual sinning. And that results in premature physical death as a means of discipline. As a means of discipline. Well, Wesley, what's your, what's your, your, your proof text for that? Well, walk with me really quickly to 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. This is what John writes. If anyone sees his brother, okay, brother, what does brother mean there? Believer, right? If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. To death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. So, however, within the context of these verses with Philippians, understand Paul, and I understand this to be that Paul is referring to unbelievers here regarding the Gnostics. He's, he's regarding to them as their false teaching and therefore their eternal end is what? Hell. Okay. Secondly, what does Paul show us? Paul continues by saying, whose God is their appetite. That the ruling of their desires, because the things that they value and pursue are above the things in which they should rightly be seeking after, right? That for those who should rightfully be seeking after God and knowing God, these individuals are seeking the desires of themselves. What satisfies me? What's good for me? I want you to notice what Paul speaks about these individuals in Romans chapter 16, Verse 17 through 19, I'll give you a minute to get there. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 through 19. Check out what the text says. I'll read it into your hearing. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, Lord Christ but of their own, here's that word that Paul likes to use, their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Okay, I will come back to that in a minute. Thirdly, what do we see? Paul mentions this, that whose glory is in their shame, whose glory is in their shame. Simply put, the things that should naturally bring about shame for these individuals becomes the very thing that they revel in. And let's just think about it in today's context. Gone are the days where one becomes shameful or disgraceful acts uh, when disgraceful acts have been done, whether in private or public, that folks are like, oh, I shouldn't have done that and kind of tuck and hide away. We're in an age now, friends, where wrong is right and right is wrong. And people's desire to do what is right in their own eyes and they expect others to fall in suit and in alignment with what is wrong and they want that to be condoned. I want to be called fill in the blank. I consider myself to be fill in the blank. And if you don't agree with that, then I'm going to cancel you. If you don't agree with that, then I'm going to sue you. If you don't, and it, it continues to grow. So imagine that if Paul was dealing with this very thing way back in first century, what makes you and I think today that we wouldn't see it now? Paul's focus 
is that the believer be able to rightly discern good from evil. Because, friends, there is a clear distinction whether the world wants to admit it or not. Again, as we read in Romans 16, verse 19, Paul's desire is that the believer be wise in what is good and innocent of what is evil. I love that. I love that. Because that word innocent in the Greek is speaking about being free from guilt and sin. Innocent meaning to avoid sin. This way of sinful living or lifestyle can't even be tied to your character. It can't even, if if someone were to say, I saw such and such saying this, that, and the fourth, somebody should be able to come up and say, not that brother, not that sister. That's not in their character. That's not in their nature. Paul's saying there shouldn't even be a whiff of it as it relates to you and I as believers in Christ. Friends, Paul does not want the Philippians to be fooled, and I pray that you and I aren't fooled either. The world is going to try to confuse and bring about confusion and say that up is down and down is up. But you and I know what the truth is. This is what is truthful. This is what is right. And they'll try to convince you otherwise. Lastly, Paul mentions that these individuals set their minds on earthly things. In other words, the temporal pleasures for these individuals becomes the prize that they pursue. For the unbeliever, they can't have their minds set on eternal things. Why? Because they don't know Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit. However, Christians, on the other hand, we do. We do have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they should have their eyes, you and I should have our eyes on on eternity and eternal things and not temporal things. So Paul provides this encouragement of following his example as he is following Christ. And in the very same breath, he provides a loving warning to not fall into the false teaching of these wicked men. Paul wants them to remain eternally minded. And in the world that we're living in today, with so much that is happening, we can oftentimes find ourselves getting caught up in the the times of the day. What is this news outlet saying? What is that news outlet saying? Oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? Here's the reality. I'm kind of giving you a little sneak peek into what's coming to the end. We already know the end. So at best, what, we should be, which, what should we be doing? Walking in joy, evangelizing and sharing the truth so that those who don't know Christ can escape the hell that is to come. Friends, when, when we remain eternally minded, it is there where we're able to experience true joy. You know, many people will say, well, folks that believe in the rapture, they're, they're just trying to, they, they want to be escapist. Right? They, they, they don't want to have to deal with trouble. And, and my response is, actually, understanding the rapture and its significance brings me great joy because I know that I don't have to deal with it. But as I'm dealing in the ugly here and the nasty now, I can walk in such a way that when the world sees me going through the ugliness of life, that they can then ask the question as the jailer did in the prison cell before he lands, tries to land on the sword. What must I do to be saved? That's the goal. You see, Paul mentions this very fact, friends, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Check this out. He says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So we're, we're now gonna, about to transition now into our last two verses in chapter Uh, 3 verses 20 and 21 and what we're going to find now is that Paul is going to make mention as to why the believers should not only be aware of these things but why the believers should remain eternally minded why we should remain eternally minded check out verses 20 and 21 he says this for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior the Lord Jesus Christ 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Hallelujah. Paul reinforces the point of citizenship because we have a heavenly citizenship, not an earthly one. Therefore, our pursuits and values must be different from the world we presently reside. We have, if, think about it this way, we have dual citizenship right now. We live in this world and we also belong to the heavenlies, right? Our true citizenship is in heaven. So the way in which we have to navigate in this world is going to naturally look different. It's going to naturally look different. And I want us to, to, to hone in on this particular word again, because the use of the term citizenship, especially for a Roman audience, brought about certain privileges regarding residency as Roman, Roman citizens in Roman colonies. And in this particular case for Philippi, them being in Macedonia. And for them to be able to say that one was a Roman citizen, it actually meant that they had certain privileges. Certain privileges, privileges came with that rather than those who were non-Roman colonies could not say. For example, the crucifixion. If you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. Therefore, when you saw earlier, Paul, I brought you into the book of Acts to understand the backstory of the book of Philippians. And what we discovered is that when Paul had gone out there with Silas and Luke and Timothy and them, when he had gone out there, and he was taken into jail because of the young woman who had the spirit of divination in her. And they wanted to release Paul and them out silently. Paul said, no, you're not about to release me silently. Because why? They found out Paul was a Roman citizen. And the fact that they did that was going to be hell for those individuals to pay. Why? You're not supposed to do that to a Roman citizen. They have privilege. So Paul is playing on this term privilege and he's paralleling this idea of citizenship as a statement of heavenly privilege as, a, as well as an encouragement to live in a manner that reflects the heavenly reality. And this again is all in juxtaposition to the previous verses regarding those who are unbelievers or those who are worldly. For example, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. In other words, although you may live in this world, you're not of this world. And with receiving, friends, this new citizenry, it means adopting the mindset and the attitude of the country. Well, what is the country that you and I are going to adopt in the coming future? We're going to be in a coming kingdom. We're going to be in the millennial kingdom, co-reigning and co-ruling with Christ for a thousand years. With Christ as king. So in order for us to prepare on what we are going to experience in the kingdom, we've been enabled right now by the Holy Spirit to live in such a way that's going to reflect how we're going to live. Does it mean we're going to look perfect now? No, but we will be perfect. And we're going to see Paul move into that argument in a little bit. So again, this is why Paul has made mention about imitating him and others like him as they follow Christ. Because why? Timothy and Epaphroditus' mind, too, were set on eternal matters. So Paul, he goes on and he, he says that along with knowing we are not of this world, I love this, he says, we eagerly await the coming of Christ. Oh, I love that, man. He mentions that as citizens of heaven, while living on earth, we anticipate and eagerly wait for a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. The anticipation is one of expected arrival. One of expected arrival. The anticipation for the coming of Christ is for the dawning of this next stage of what the first resurrection is about. Meaning that because Christ's resurrection was the first, with him being the first fruits of those who fell asleep, we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 
it's confirmed in scripture that we too will have a similar experience. A similar experience. That when the Lord meets you and I in the clouds, we will be raised and receiving new bodies. This is what Paul describes in verse 21. This is the glorification section, if you will, of the book of Philippians. He says that the Lord Jesus will transform the body of our humble state, and in the original Greek, it actually says the bodies of our humiliation, and provides us with a glorified body like his. In a moment, brand new bodies. This moment, friends, at the rapture, is where we will experience the third tense of salvation, glorification. At that moment, when our bodies are raised and we are given new glorified bodies, we will attain an incorruptible body, meaning removed from the presence of sin, sinless. Almost back, it's back to that Edenic state where there was no sin. Friends, this further confirms Paul's teaching of the imminency of the rapture. It confirms it. Simply put, Paul was very much anticipating the rapture could take place at any day. As a matter of fact, this event could happen at any moment. This event is what Paul described as the moment in which every believer should anticipate with great expectancy. So in the meantime, in our present state, we are going to wrestle, right? We're going to have issue with our flesh and our spirit, our earthly condition, but yet our heavenly reality. And it goes back and forth. And as we mentioned before, there are two, these are two things that are happening at war with one another. However, understand what is to come. What is to come, again, at any moment, allows the believer to live in such a way that we are already ready. What do you mean, Wes? The fact that we know what the rapture is about, Paul says, I want to give you a heavenly perspective. You ought to live as if you will stand before him at any moment. When you think about that, that's huge. That, I mean, that, that changes how you see life. It changes how you deal with people. It changes how you deal with the pettiness of life. Because if I realize that at any moment he can catch me up, harpazo, he can catch me up to the clouds, then I want to make sure up until that moment that I'm living in such a way that when I see him, well done, well done. And what we can be confident about, friends, is knowing that the Lord is soon to return to remove us from this wasted, wicked, crazy world. That's what we anticipate. Now, some may ask, and, and, and folks have tried to debate on YouTube here and there, Wes, where do you get the confidence about the rapture from? Right? Where does that come from? Well, we see it in many places. But where does Jesus say it, right? That's how people try to trip you up in, in, in debate, in, in apology. Where does Jesus say it? Because Jesus' words are important. Absolutely, they are. So I'm about to take you. You ready? Here we go. Journey. Let's dive in. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. I want you to listen to the language that Jesus uses here. And again, friends, this is just one. When we get into, when we get into the teaching of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you're going to see Paul reek of rapture language. Check out what Jesus says. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and check it out, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So what was Jesus talking about here as he was um, confront, um, confronting and preparing, excuse me, his disciples for his soon-to-be departure? What was he doing here? 
Well, Jesus is letting them know that he would come back for them again and receive them unto himself. Jesus, friends, is coming for his church at the rapture. There is your, com your, your confirmation, your hallelujah. And it will be there that we will be with him. But as Paul mentioned earlier, we will also be like him. Paul makes this point even uh, in Thess to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Check out the text. This is Paul saying, then we who are alive, meaning those who are still living and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What is the comfort, comfort in knowing these words? The comfort is knowing that we will be caught up with the Lord. With the saints who have died, they will be raised first, and then we will be raised. This is not a spiritual raising. This is a physical thing that's happening. And in this new glorified state, the, the text states that we will also be with the Lord. Lastly, as we wrap up here, notice how this amazing transformation will happen. Here, here's where you see the power of God. This amazing transformation will happen with us transforming, check it out, from these earthly mortal bodies to these glorified bodies. Paul states that it is accomplished by the exertion of the power of the Lord Jesus. The, the word exertion in the Greek here is where we get our word in, uh, energy from. It's the Greek word energia, energia. This will be, friends, the very power of God, the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is going to transform these wretched bodies in having these new glorified bodies. And again, what glory that will be. Friends, this is a new glorified state. We will be made perfect children of God. And in his perfect power, the Lord not only is going to change our bodies, but ultimately he says that all things are going to be subjected under him. Think about Psalm chapter 110. All things are going to be submitted under Christ. What a glorious salvation we have in him. This, friends, should produce incorruptible joy because we know the end. This reality should produce an appetite, a hunger to serve the Lord well in this life, knowing that we will have an eternity being with him. And I want you to just imagine how much more we will be able to know the Lord Jesus in a perfect state beyond what we know of him now in our current state in our earthly bodies. Friends, the best is yet to come for the believer in Christ. And may we live in the joy of the Lord and the anticipation of the coming of our bridegroom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful of your truth. Lord, knowing that you are coming back for us and it's at any moment. That we will not have to endure the tribulation that is to come. Because you've promised that you will come back for your bride. Let us rest in that. And as we rest in that, Father, I pray that you give us the strength by the enabling power of your spirit to live out in a way that reflects the glory that is to come so that those who do not know you may come to know you and that in knowing you, they will be able to walk too in a manner that is worthy of Christ. Lord, that where we are lacking in our walk with you in sanctification, will you deal with us, Lord, graciously Expose the areas of our hearts that are not conforming to you so that we may be conformed to you. We thank you for the work that you're doing, have done and will continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen.